Welcome to the Standard Deviations Podcast, presented by Orion Advisor Solutions and hosted by Dr. Daniel Crosby, Orion's Chief Behavioral Officer and New York Times bestselling author. Each week, Dr. Crosby interviews a fascinating new guest on a range of compelling topics, from literature to psychology to financial wellness. To learn more about Dr. Crosby's behavioral finance work at Orion, visit www.orion.com. Hello, and welcome to the Standard Deviations Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Daniel Crosby, and I'm joined today by Anika Hoiberg. She's going to be a bit of a first of the kind here on Standard Deviations. She is the founder and owner of ABI, Autism and Behavioral Intervention. She has a number of master's degrees and is currently completing a PhD in applied behavioral analysis. She is here to talk about the financial realities of families with children on the spectrum, as well as leadership lessons neurotypical folks can learn from children with autism. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. It's awesome to have you here. So we have many friends in common, right? We met socially a little while ago, and I knew that I had to have you on. So tell us... You are so thoughtful. Thank you. (laughs) No, no, no. My pleasure. So start a little bit by telling us about the journey that led you to found ABI. Sure. Sure. So I've always been passionate about people with special needs and individuals who have, you know, disabilities. When I was in high school, I volunteered for Special Olympics. And then when I went to BYU, that's where I got my undergraduate, I really got involved with Special Olympics and became the area coordinator for Utah Special Olympics. And so I got to put on events and just developed really strong relationships with a lot of those people. Um, Later, I went to school and became a school psychologist, and so I was able to do a lot of those things. But as I was in the schools, I kind of noticed that that there was a lack of services. Mm -hmm. And somebody really, really close to me, um, a family member, started showing signs of autism. And I had had a couple degrees and I realized I didn't have enough to be able to support the needs of the people that I was serving and so I traveled around the country and I looked at different services and different ABA centers and then I came home and got a couple more degrees and opened up this center and I realized that these these children and these individuals deserved better and so we had to find something better. So Tell me a little bit about where ABI is today. How many folks do you serve? How long have you been around? Okay, so we've been around for about nine years. Mm -hmm. I started on a whim. You know, some people can say it was brave or some people can say it was really silly that you jump into something. Um, But when I first started, we had a little building that was 3,500 square feet and we had about four kids who would come. Three years ago, we moved into a 38,000 square foot building. We have over 125 employees and we serve hundreds of children and we provide lots of services for families um, and yeah all all ages all ranges from severe to moderate mild we do it all speech occupational therapy so it's kind of fun no it's incredible yeah. so I worked at an ABA clinic in Alabama I did not know that. Uh, I know. I worked at an ABA clinic doing diagnostic work exclusively yeah. uh, when, I, when I got out of college. And it was started by my good friend, right? Shout mm-hmm. out to Melody Crane. And she had cool. an adopted son uh, who was on the spectrum. And very same story, right? Like just not adequate resources to give him the kind of care and love and attention that he needed. She wanted it done right, so she had to do it herself. And they've continued to, to flourish and grow just, just like you have. Amazing. But you know the growth of your center speaks to speaks to the need, and, and we're going to get to that in a little bit. But I find perhaps because it is a spectrum disorder, yeah. I, I find that there's a lot of confusion uh, around you know folks on the spectrum and and, and how they present and, and and what they need. What are some of the most common misconceptions or myths mistruths that that you encounter when sure. when people hear what you do? Sure. So, yeah, a lot of people will initially say, oh, that's really hard or, oh, that takes a lot of patience. And I think it's the exact opposite. Like for me, it is the greatest privilege and I get to learn so much. There are some common misconceptions and media has done a little bit of that, you know, where people will say, oh, they have autism. They must have a specialized skill or they must be somewhat of a savant. So it's Rain Man. Right. Stuff, and yeah. so people will always think that, or, you know, they'll kind of go to that. We don't see that very often. Mm-hmm. You know, there can be um, a lot of, a lot of kids have maybe some topics that they like to talk about a lot, or they like to fixate on certain ideas a little bit, mm-hmm. but we don't see that part as much. Um, I mean, they are gifted and we have in lots of different ways, you know, and 
Um, the other thing I would say is that a majority of individuals with autism, well, not a majority, but a, a large number, are nonverbal. Mm. And so people will often treat them as though they don't understand just because they can't talk. And so they'll talk maybe to their caregiver or they'll talk around them and not directly to them. One of my friends, she has a great story um, about her son who's nonverbal. She denied him some of his favorite chips. Uh -huh. And she's like, nope, sorry, you can't have these Lay's chips. Five minutes later, she looks at her computer and she noticed that he had just gone to Amazon and a case of these chips was now being delivered to their house. You know, like, we, you can't, I don't know, you can't underestimate sure. what they can understand because they understand everything. Talk, talk to me about the importance of, uh, what is ABA? First okay. of all, I think a lot of people won't understand what ABA is generally, because I think it's quite different than many of the more, uh, you know, conventional, traditional psychotherapeutic modalities. Right. And, and then talk about the importance of early intervention, because I think we're, we're learning a lot more about that now. Right. So, Applied Behavior Analysis is ABA, and it's where we look at behavior and we figure out where a child is at and then where we want them to be. Yeah. And so we systematically put interventions into place and we use a lot of data and it's all science and research based. So if a child isn't talking, that's what we look at. We don't care about the diagnosis. We look at the behavior and it's all focused on behavior. So if they're not talking and we want to get them to talk, we put a whole bunch of steps in place, even if we're tracking okay, this is how many sounds they've made on this day, we need to increase the amount of sounds. And now we need to shape those sounds into words. And then we eventually shape them into sentences. And so it's very much of a behavioral approach rather than a psychological or like mentalistic approach, as they right. say in psychology. Yeah, yeah. It's more of what do we see and how do we get them to where we want them to be? So break down shaping for, for the listeners. Now my listeners are gonna be largely financial professionals, financial advisors predominantly. This is something that I talk about a lot because okay. I find that financial advisors, say they have a client who presents with you know, a financial problem, a financial disorder, if you will. A lot of times the, the move is to try and solve that psychologically, to try and solve that mentally, to point out the error in that thinking and then to ask them to effectively swing for the fences, right? Like you're doing this thing all the way wrong, stop it immediately, 180 and do something different. All the literature, whether it's on ABA, whether it's on you know uh, the type of stuff that I do, talks about the importance of incremental change and shaping. So maybe like give the example yeah. of, of how you might shape a behavior uh, in, in an ABA setting and then I'll try and extrapolate it to, to my world. Okay, yeah, yeah so shaping we do it all the time we do it with everything right but let's take it with even speaking with a child who mm -hmm. has autism let's say they're not saying anything initially but they might make some type of a vocal sound like uh we're going to reinforce that mm -hmm. we're going to initially give them everything that they want so let's say i'm wanting to teach them the word ball i don't need to start with a b or an a or an l sound i'm going to start with whatever they've got Whatever they're coming at me with, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that and say, hey, there's a vocalization. We're going to reinforce this. You get this. You get something faster by vocalizing than by doing something like headbanging or hitting or screaming. Mm -hmm. A vocalization is going to get you that. So then eventually, like if it is an ah sound, mm -hmm. then I'm going to go, okay, we'll use ah, and then I'm going to start to build on all, right? And then I might go back and add the B after we've gotten there for the all, and then ball, and then I want, but like, we'll, we'll eventually get through the whole thing, but I'm starting off on those smallest little sounds, and I will count that as a huge success, and I will give them, like, if they like Swedish fish, I'm going to give them the whole handful of Swedish fish initially, you know, so that they know this is what gets me where I want to go. And then we start to pull that back a little bit until they're finally saying, hey, do you want to go outside and play basketball with right. me? Right, yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? No, that's beautiful. I yeah. think, you know, for, for the advisors that are listening to this show, right, there's you're seeing why I wanted to have Anika on, right? First of all, there's this abundance mentality. There's this client-centric mentality that says, you know, people come to you and say, oh, autism, that must be difficult. And you say, no, they're, you know, they're, they're brilliant folks. They have all these, all these strengths where all other people see as deficits. You know, my world of behavioral finance for so long has been all about cataloging all the ways that people are screwy with money. Like, you know, all the ways that people make mistakes what we can do is exactly what she's talking about. Honor where they're at, yep. right? Mm -hmm. the, inevitably, they're doing something right in their financial life. 
identify that thing and build on that incrementally. And if you want to take them somewhere, whatever it is, $2 million for retirement, whatever it is, you drop that $2 million number on someone who's nowhere close to that today, they're going to freak out, right? But if you can shape, if you can subdivide that $2 million goal into 10 sort of micro behaviors that it takes to get there, you introduce that first one, you complement them like crazy, you build on their existing strengths, it's the same it's the same deal. It's behavior. It's behavior. Yeah, and reinforcing <laughs> that and I think that you made a really good point and especially with autism or with anybody these children or these people don't have deficits. Mm. It's not that they're deficit in anything. We might they might need to be working on skills, but I full-heartedly believe that they have everything they need to be to be who we need them to be and to be who they need to be, mm-hmm. you know, in this life. I don't, and and I think that's something it's just our job and it's our privilege to get to help them progress, not, yeah. So the, the, listeners, the listeners of my show will know kind of my pet unscientific theory, which is that people respond to how you feel about them. Yeah. Have you seen that with the kids you work with, that, that a therapist who's working with them, who, who loves them, who cares about them, even if sort of the tactics are the same, if the bag of tricks are the same, does that, does that care? shine through and and elicit different outcomes in 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 the child well you know how i feel about this because this (laughs) is what i'm wanting to do my dissertation on okay um because you know there's there's kindness that really can impact how people are treated like i've been in situations where people have come to me and i've been working on something that i felt was really difficult Mm -hmm. and they've come to me and and taught me in kindness and i'm like oh that was a really great experience yeah or they've come to me with frustration and anger and i'm like oh i hated doing that but, you know, there's a saying in our field right now um, that's really taking a lot of uh, attention and, and is just a great way that we're starting to implement things. And it's called HRE, mm-hmm. which means we want our kids to always be happy, relaxed, and engaged. Mm. And so those are really important components. Like, people learn better when they're happy, relaxed, and engaged. Yeah. And so that's something that we always focus on at our center. We're not going to force a compliance. We're not going to force learning a skill because that relationship is paramount. We always focus on the relationship and understanding why those things are happening yeah. before we try and change something. And so that's why, you know, that kindness component, the compassionate component, understanding, because a lot of these kids, they can't talk or they can't advocate for themselves and so helping them to feel happy relaxed and engaged we have found sig- the research just shows if you can get kids there you you have the greatest you know opportunity for success so i love that happy relaxed and engaged so the number one stressor in the lives of americans since the apa started measuring it every year is mm-hmm. money yeah. and if you look at the recent surveys the number one stressors money the number one the, the number two stressor is work and the number three stressor is the economy right wow. so it's money money and money yeah Effect, effectively yeah. Or, or sort it of, all circles back <clears throat> to money yeah it's yeah. sort of one two three and then you look at the number one reason why clients don't present to the office of a financial advisor and it's uh, fearful of being judged right they're, they're fearful of being scolded of being judged of being reprimanded i think that hre is something that that you know, me and my listeners can take. Yeah. Because there's a power differential between an advisor and a client, right? The, right. the client or the clients walk into your room, you're in your suit behind your fancy desk, whatever. You want to minimize that power differential. You want to act from the heart, keep them happy, relaxed, and engaged. I yeah. Love it. Well, and we do that with, we do that with our kids all the yeah. time because there can be a power differential. Mm-hmm. And even like, it's like, we're, you know, we say get low, like yeah. get down on your knees, like don't don't be in that power position even. Yeah, yeah. Like, how do you help them feel the most relaxed, engaged, and happy? Yeah. So, uh, listeners, go back and, and check out my episode with Dr. Sonia Luter, where we talked about the optimal configuration of an office to help there people get happy, relaxed, and engaged, get down on their level. So, one of the things that uh, that always comes up when you're talking about spectrum disorders is the the precipitous growth of, of autism spectrum disorders. Um, where do you fall down on this? What's is is it superior diagnostic abilities? I mean, certainly we're we're, we're looking for it more. We have better diagnostic tools. We we know more about it. So that would account for some of the rise. 
Is there more though? Like what, I know you can get on thin ice with this, but like what, what do you think about what's the, causing the rise of, of spectrum disorders? You know, I wish I knew. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that. And like you said, we do have better diagnostic tools. I think though that the rate of autism is going to even increase more because you know, as you look at the research, you know, one in 44 children with autism ha or children have autism and it's more prevalent in males, you mm -hmm. know, one in one in four are girls, but they're starting to do a lot more research now that says that girls present differently with autism than boys do. And so all of the diagnostic tools that we've used in the past are very male centric. Sure. They focus more on some of that male presentation, but they're finding that girls present different, but also have those same characteristics that are manifesting in different ways. And so you'll look, like it says, like one in 126 girls, uh -huh. but I think that's going to increase even more now that we're starting to identify some of those things. And so, I mean, as high as the rate is now, I think it's going to get even higher. What, I, I mean, I don't know nothing about this. What, how does autism present differently in, in girls than in boys? So. There's a lot of research that's being done right now and how girls can more easily mask or camouflage some of the symptoms and signs and characteristics of autism and that they can be a little more social or maintain better eye contact. But then there are also characteristics in women that are more acceptable by society in being a little more shy, in not being as vocal, and, you know, and, and that they're prided more for their intelligence or maybe... And autism doesn't present physically, and so if girls are attractive or if they kind of are a little more quiet, our society is like, oh, that's fine. So since girls and women are socialized to be sort of meek and quiet, we don't raise the red flag as readily, oh, it's so interesting. Isn't that interesting? And then later as they get older, they are a little, they can be more social and mm -hmm. read more social cues. Mm -hmm. and. It, I mean, that gets us into a whole other area of things, but yeah, yeah. Like, there's, there are different characteristics where they are able to read those cues a little bit more, but not talk and express as much. So interesting. So one of the things that I want to talk about here, and I think you're going to be able to, to help us with here, a lot of advisors listen to this show. Um, they're all going to have clients. I mean, you're yes. throwing out these numbers, like every single one. When you think that the average advisor probably serves something on the order of 100 plus families, right. right? every every single advisor listening to this is going to have a family uh, with at least uh, one client with who's either on the spectrum or has a, a child on the spectrum. So I looked up some of the stats around this. The lifetime cost of a person with autism uh, are in the one and a half to two and a half million dollar range. The average cost for intensive early intervention or ABA is in the range of forty to sixty thousand dollars per year. I mean, this is what the average American family takes home in a year. Right. It's, you know, forty to sixty thousand right. dollars mm -hmm. uh, for financial advisors with with clients who are on the spectrum or or have children on the spectrum. What are some of the financial considerations? Like, help us navigate this because I know you're very good at this. Well, this has been one of the things that's been so hard. When I started my center in twenty six, well, twenty fourteen we didn't have any insurance coverage. And so people were paying for all of these services out of pocket. They were mortgaging their house, getting second mortgages on their house, you know, selling heirloom jewelry, Jeez. and even saying like, you know, we'll cut down on our food budget mm -hmm. each month so that we can get these services for our kids. And um, luckily in the state of Utah, we were able to get services mandated in 2016. Wow. That isn't very long. But last year, they were able to mandate it in all 50 states. Barely. Can you believe it? Wow. So last year, we're now able to have that. And they had a big celebration at the Autism Law Summit yeah. where now it's all covered. Um, they still have huge financial responsibilities, though, because mm -hmm. that's just for ABA. Right. That doesn't include speech. That doesn't include occupational therapy. And you also know that with the majority of people with autism, they also have comorbidities. Mm -hmm. And so they're not just... A, you know, impacted by autism, but there could be other things and medications. And we know like sleep issues and food interventions and all of that stuff play a really large part. So, and deductibles are high. Um, in each state, hopefully in our state, we have an amazing program car called the Carson Smith Scholarship mm -hmm. that can come in and cover those deductibles. And that was meant for middle of the road families who are middle and even above average because 
they didn't fall in the Medicaid range, mm-hmm. and then they weren't extremely wealthy that yeah. it didn't impact them, but they were in that middle range, mm-hmm. like you're saying, where, you know, that sixty to $150,000. I don't even know if that's what's average. Yeah, but it's 50 or 60 is average. Yeah. yeah, so right around there. And they they needed something to help mm-hmm. because it wasn't, those things don't just impact the child. It impacts the whole family. Yeah. Because then if they're having to spend money on all this therapy, then the other kids don't get dance lessons. They don't get to have piano lessons. They don't get to go to the camps. They don't get to do any of those other things. And so... Being able to supplement that with some of the scholarships, I know that they also have things. I was I was talking to somebody, and they said that there are things like ABLE accounts, if you're familiar with those, um, where you can put sixteen thousand in. That's not tax; it's tax free. Um, different things like that. But I think making it so that insurance covered ABA mm-hmm. made a huge difference because I would say sixty thousand is on the light side. On the low side. Because yeah. a lot of these kids get thirty hours a week. Yeah. And it's around $65 an hour yeah. up to $150 an hour because it's such specialized treatment. Mm-hmm. And so it is tough. But yeah. being able to get really good insurance and then finding scholarships or finding other ways to supplement your deductible is yeah. probably the better way to go. So, yeah, to keep, keep pulling that thread for a minute. If an advisor has a client who comes to them who, you know, potentially despairing over this sort of enormous cost as hard for even wealthy families to cover, where would you direct them? I mean, do they, yeah. do they go to their insurance company? Are there insurance hacks? Yeah. So it kind of depends, right? Because some people have like private insurance that they have to get from their own or, or some of their employers have even opted out of the autism benefits, mm-hmm. which is really frustrating because they can have great insurance, but it just won't cover the autism benefits, uh-huh. which is really frustrating. So we've had to work hard and we've called up the employers or we've called the insurance companies and had to fight to get those services. There's with, like I said, the autism law summit, there's an amazing woman there. Her name is Lori Unum and she is an attorney and she has fought to help get the services throughout the country. And she says, if there's an insurance company that won't cover this, call me. And she's like, I'll call them up and I'll fight to get it. That's so awesome. she's like, she's ready to go. Well, yeah. I was thinking like, even, uh, even if you or, or a child or a loved one are not on the spectrum, it seems like something we should all be doing. So to sort of rallying to, yeah. to contact our insurance providers and saying, look, like you gotta, you gotta take care of this. Right. Right. I mean, yeah. yeah. It's so needed because if they can get the services long-term, it benefits every, or short, like in the, you know, early intervention, like you were saying, then long-term it can reduce some of those costs because we're creating more independence. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, so much of the focus now has been on, uh, you know, in our conversation heretofore, has been on uh, a child with an autism spectrum disorder. But of course, there's plenty of adults who are neurodivergent as well. And I want to talk about that, right? Because yeah. just as, uh, you know, just as likely uh, as an advisor is going to have a, a family with a child on the spectrum, they're very likely to have a, a client, an, an adult on the spectrum, if not a, a handful right. of, of clients who are on the spectrum. So connection is so important, right, for the work of a financial advisor. I mean, effectively, like the whole premise of this podcast is that it bears a ton in, in common with, with counseling and other sort of, sort of therapeutic types of intervention. What tips would you have for, for a financial advisor to, to connect with and, and, and sort of build a relationship with a, a neurodivergent client? Well, and I think you're absolutely right. And we have parents of the children who come to our center who have autism. And sometimes they may know, and sometimes they may not know that they have autism, but some of them are our most successful like parents. They, financially, they've found a niche, they've found something that really works, yeah. and brilliant minds sure. that come in. And, and so they've talked to me about that kind of stuff and recognizing, like, I need to set up accounts for my child later mm-hmm. because we've seen that where like there might be a parent who then also has a child who has autism. I have about six employees who work for me mm-hmm. who have autism Yeah, and they're fantastic. Mm-hmm. They're amazing. And I think when working with, you know, neurodivergent individuals, um, I've talked to them individually and I'm like, what are some things that I can do? Because everybody is different, Yeah, you know? And so I've talked to them and I've said, what can I do in order to accommodate or make some modifications? Because what I've also found is that when we make accommodations for individuals with autism, 
everybody actually likes it. Yeah. You know, like if we change like the lighting a little bit, so it's more comfortable. Everybody's like, Hey, why does that feel so good? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, or little things like, one of my employees, she's like, you know, Anika, I really like having clear expectations. If ah. you can tell me how to do this and how to do this. And I'm like, sure, I can do that. Mm-hmm. I can make that modification. That doesn't hurt me at all. And everybody's like, hey, I kind of like that too. Yeah. You know? And so that works for her. Another one is like, I cannot wear tight fitting clothes. Mm-hmm. I can't wear jeans. I can't wear these kind of things. Are you okay if I wear sweatpants to work yeah. or if I do these things? I'm like, I don't, yes, of course. That's yeah. totally fine. But we get caught up maybe in what our expectations are Mm -hmm. instead of understanding some of these modifications. You know, like, you know, it's like it's a compromise and it's not a sacrifice. Right. Right. Like we can compromise on some of these things and then find that there are huge benefits because these people who work for me, they come with ideas that I'm like, how did you think of that? Yeah. And they understand and they connect in ways that are very meaningful, but are a little bit different. And so I think clear expectations a lot of people with autism see things black and white uh-huh. and might be a little bit blunt. I don't mind that. Some people do, yeah. you know? And so having very direct conversations sometimes can be very helpful. So, well, it's one of those things. It's good to know what to expect though. Right. Because right. I think depending on how you grew up and what part of the country you live in, we in the South uh, speak in circles. We're never direct. Right. right? We're, right. we're never direct. So it's kind of jarring. I remember my first client from New York. I was just like so taken aback. They're just like asking for what they wanted. And I was like, what is this? Right. right? But so right. it helps to have those expectations. And I love the point that you made that a lot of what's good, uh, a, a lot of what's good for neurodivergent folks is good for everyone. And we'd be, right. you know, we'd be all well served to have this conversation. So clear expectations, Understanding that if there's a level of truth telling or bluntness, right, then um, that's not to be, you know, not to take no, offense at that. That no. that's just, yeah. you know, uh, and it can be really refreshing. Absolutely. You know, like I feel like I'm so lucky because every day I get to be around people who are completely authentic. Right. Like I don't need to worry, you know, if if somebody. Where you stand? No, yeah. no, you know, and it's really great. And I'm like, okay, I know exactly where we're at, and I don't have to second guess things. And that's awesome. Yeah. It's, that's awesome. It's really fun. So I had two roles at the at the ABA clinic where I, I worked. I, I started off um, exclusively uh, doing diagnostic work, right? Like yeah. just sort of uh, implementing the test to see if insurance would cover a spectrum disorder, things like that. But I quickly uh, branched into working with uh, the parents of kids on the spectrum who were having a host of, of other problems, uh, largely marital problems, financial problems, other things like this. For financial advisors who serve these families, what should they know about the stressors that sort of accompany having a a child on the spectrum? How can they be empathetic and and well-informed to give them good guidance? You know, I don't know if any of us can even come close to understanding what families are going through. Mm -hmm. I hear what families go through. I hear about the holes in the wall or not sleeping at night Mm -hmm. or the aggression or self-injury or just the anxiety that parents are, are feeling because of having a child with autism. And, you know, I get a tiny glimpse and I might go into their home for minutes or, you know, hours but I'm not living that every day, you know, where it is like parents just come and they're exhausted. And one of the reasons why I did start ABI is because of this, Mm -hmm. because I saw that look on parents' faces. Initially when they would come in, it was hopeless and it was apologetic. Mm -hmm. It was always like, we don't know what to do. We don't know where to go. And then if their child would scream or if they would hit something, they'd always apologize. Like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm like, you don't need to apologize here. Right. And we're going to help you feel hope again. And so I think that's the thing is always being willing to be supportive. One mom who talked to me, she said, I have the best boss ever boss. She's just like, when something happens with my daughter, he's like, go, go take care of it. You know, and the flexibility there and being able to understand, like my child has severe needs Mm -hmm. and maybe there's nobody else who can come and take care of this. You know, we've had children I've seen where they've blinded themselves or they've put themselves in the hospital in multiple situations because of self-injury. And sometimes those things are overwhelming to parents. Like how 
our children are our most valuable resource. Mm -hmm. And if they're struggling, nothing else matters. Yeah. You know, the money doesn't matter, the house doesn't matter, nothing matters. And so recognizing what a weight that is and being able to be compassionate and flexible and understanding, but then also just very supportive yeah. and a listening ear sometimes because that marital stress is real. Yeah. That anxiety is real. The financial, like they have so many things. One mom said to me, she's like, you know, as far as my stress level, she's like, I'm always at an eight. Mm -hmm. And she says, it doesn't take very much to get me to a 10. Yeah. And just understanding that they are dealing with a lot that I, I don't even know. Yeah. You know? No, no. I mean, I, I, I worked with so many couples and it's like until you've been there, right? I mean, you can you can listen, you can empathize as best you can. But, um, I you know, I loved what you said because this touches every part of a person's life, right? I mean, yeah. this, this, a lot of dominoes fall when you have a kid with special needs and advisors need to be well positioned to, to not only address the you know, the financial elements of a client's life. But I think, you know, I, I think one of the things that I always preach is that a quarter of all visits to a GP end in a referral to a mental health practitioner, mm -hmm. right? Because so much of what uh, presents as sort of ostensibly a physical complaint is really a mental thing, right? And so doctors have to be, you know, medical doctors have to be well resourced with respect to referring clients to people like, you know, you and I. And then I think that uh, financial advisors, right, who are working with families who have kids on the spectrum, they're gonna encounter all kinds of things that present as financially financial, but are really a lot bigger than that. Yeah. And I think if they could be empathetic in the ways that you've said, and also a, a point of referral and a point of support and compassion, that would be an awesome thing. Well, an understanding, it's gonna change. through. Yeah. It's not like a broken <laughs> leg. You know, it's not like, oh, you go in and you get it fixed and then it's done and we don't need to worry about it anymore. When they're a child and an infant, toddler, middle school, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school, an adult, all of those are very different. And they have to be able to have different financial means in each of those. You know, I was I was talking to a mom yesterday and she's like, I have to think of what's going to happen after I die yeah. for my child. And she said, and it's one of those catch 22. She goes, because of course I want him to outlive me, but I'm so worried that he's going to outlive me, mm -hmm. you know? And that's so different than when you're trying to get early intervention for your three-year-old. That's a huge financial strain. Yeah. But then thinking of the end of life, that's really difficult too. And so it's something that follows them throughout their whole life and changes and they don't always know how to handle it. Yeah. No, it's a, I hadn't even thought to ask that to sort of track it through the lifespan, right? But when the, when the child's four, it may be, how do I afford ABA? When the child's 34, it may be, how do we set up some estate planning and some things in place so that there will be, you know, resources and, and appropriate guardianship for my child and like all these sort of concerns. So it's a, uh, just, I mean, just like any kind of parenthood, it's an evolving concern over time and, and you got to be primed and ready to have that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when I was, everyone's getting like a, a brief tour of my professional career. When I was um, working at the ABA clinic, I was sort of on my way out of clinical work. This was sort of my last, last uh, breaths of my clinical work and I was headed into the corporate world and I was doing probably 50, 50 uh, clinical and corporate work. And something I did at that time, I was writing a lot and I wrote an article, I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you, but I found an article that was talking about what, what effectively business leaders could learn from kids on the spectrum. Because I was working with these two, two different groups at the same time, right? And, and the two things that really stood out to me uh, one you've already mentioned. One was unfiltered dialogue. Yeah. Right. So I'm I'm trying to help these corporate execs have, you know, candid conversations with their peers, and there's all manner of subterfuge and BS and, you know, running in circles. And meanwhile, the kids I'm working with are just out there, right? You know, and I'm like, this is one thing that you could you could learn from these kids. And the second thing was creativity. Absolutely. Right? There was a level of, I mean, there's just. What, what passes for a quote unquote best practice in business is a lot of times just stale thinking, right? And it's just sort of like, yeah, it's just stale, lame thinking. And so I wrote this article saying like, look, you guys have a lot to learn from these kids. You can't have my two. I already took those two. 
what else can what else can 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 folks in finance can can everyday neurotypical folks learn from learn from people on the spectrum? I would say one of the greatest things, and it almost will get me emotional, is resilience. Like these kids do hard stuff every day, and they keep doing it, and they keep doing it, and they have to fight harder than we do to get their needs met, or to get people to communicate with them, or to see them. And they keep doing it and they keep trying. Yeah. It's really, really inspiring to me to see that. You know, I just think of a little thing. Like imagine not being able to talk mm. and not being able to communicate any of your needs, but still trying and still doing it and still working to get those needs met. It's pretty remarkable, I think, to see that resilience. And then also they enjoy the little things. You know, I was talking to somebody and they said, you know, we went to the dinosaur museum and there are all these amazing things and all the kids are so excited. But this other kid, all he wanted to do was count the fire extinguishers. <laughs> you know, like it was like, how many fire extinguishers does this building have? And I've learned from them how much to just take like that prosaic versus the poetic, mm -hmm. you know, and be able to look at the beauty in these little things. And I'm just, I am amazed sometimes at how they will find something that everybody else just thinks is mundane and, and consider it the most beautiful thing. Yeah. And so I would say that, that they really appreciate things and also very resilient. Think, think about this, right? Think about if we could all live our lives that way, be a little, tell a little bit more truth, be a little bit more creative, find a little more wonder in the mundane, bounce back a little harder. There's a lot we could, a lot we could learn. And the way that you're voice chokes up and the way that you get yeah. emotional about this, it's, it's clear that this is meaningful work. So for the advisors listening to this, I, I you know, I think two pieces of, of advice, like at, at a minimum, this will impact you. Like this will impact Absolutely. you. This will impact your practice. Familiarize yourself, uh, both generally and specifically with, with, you know, autism spectrum disorders broadly, but then how the financial needs of, of, families with, that are impacted by this are different than those who are not. The other thing that I would love to see, this may exist, I don't know about it. There's all these financial advisors who serve niche groups, right? So small business owners, defense contractors, dentists, you know, who, you know, whatever, like name a group and have developed real niches around this. Talking to you today, there need to be the Anika Hoybergs of financial advice, whose entire practice is built around the particularities of serving families who are impacted by autism. So there's a business idea. And you'd have people beating down your door. You would. Yeah. I mean, listen to the numbers you, you shouted out earlier. Know that, I mean, just in the same way that there's, you know, uh, LGBTQ focused advisors. I mean, this is the, the same sort of thing. There's advisors who work with, you know, uh, small business owners, all this, right? Different groups have different financial needs. This is, I, and this a isn't just a one time yeah. thing. This is something where they'll need to advise throughout their lives. Yeah. Yeah. No. So I hope, I hope that some of the folks listening to this will develop a real deep expertise in this and a real specialty in it. Thank you so much for the work that you do broadly. Thank you for, for sharing your wisdom with my audience. Um, if people want to learn more about ABI, if they want to learn more about autism, where, where, can, where can they find more information? Yeah, sure. So we're in Draper, Utah, and our website is just abilearningcenter.com. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. So, yep, just contact me that way. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's such a pleasure. Thanks for tuning in to Standard Deviations. If you can't wait till next week for more behavioral finance insights, visit www.orion.com. All opinions expressed by Dr. Daniel Crosby and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of or endorsement by Orion and its affiliates, subsidiaries, and employees. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for legal, tax, and investment decisions. The opinions are based upon information the participants consider reliable.